And as they were going through the front door, he was going out onto the roof. Thankfully, we managed to get the police helicopter up and he was caught as he was going onto the roof and then taken into a police station. But a really violent individual on arrest and a really violent, abusive, aggressive individual whilst he was in custody. It was at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night in June that emergency services were called to Stirling Gardens following an explosion and subsequent fire. Fire crews and the police were called into the scene. When the fire brigade attend a fire and they think that there are suspicious circumstances, and in this case it was clearly suspicious, there was two bodies in the flat and it was obvious from looking at the bodies that there was also other injuries to them. I've been to quite a few post-mortems in my time. I have to say, I've never seen bodies that have been damaged as badly. Laurent Bonomo was stabbed close to 200 times across his head, torso, abdomen, legs, arms. Gabriel was stabbed 50 times. He was quite badly burnt as well. So both young men had been tied up, both at the hands and feet. Uh, they'd had some form of covering put placed over their heads as well. So it was quite a, um, well, it, it, it was quite a dreadful scene to see these two young men, what had happened to them. What the pathologist discovered was there was no soot in the lungs of either of the two young men, so they were both dead by the time the fire took place. That was it, uh, 10 o'clock at night. But the really horrible thing was that there was injuries inflicted to Laurent's head penetrating the skull when he was still alive. One of the informants who called 999 uh, had heard glass smashing, then an explosion, looked out the window, and thankfully seen uh, what we felt was a, a strong suspect for the offence running away. That witness had shouted to this individual something along the lines of, I've got you. And they noted their face. They saw that there was something strange about them. And fortunately, they had very good recall and were able to present the police with an extremely efficient EFIT. On day one, we had absolutely nothing. Day two, we were starting to understand a bit about the victims. Day three and four, we're starting to get an intelligence picture about what's going on in the local community. And then day five, day six, we start to get more intelligence in, start to get some names coming in, and then we start to get CCTV, we start to get bank details coming in. So it all starts to fall into place. We had the EFIT before I did the press conference on day five, four or five, but I didn't want to release it at that time. I knew that I was something else in my back pocket that I could release at a later date mm -hmm. if I needed to do that. And that's what we did on the seven day anniversary. back to the scene, roadblocks, mounted branch, local officers. It was, a, it was a big event for us to encourage people to come forward. And actually, we did at, trace some witnesses as a result of that. At the end of the uh, anniversary appeal, that seven-day anniversary appeal, I got to bed, and probably about 20 minutes later, I get a phone call to say the suspect has walked into Lewisham Police Station and given himself up. So all of that pressure, all of that into the media, getting people talking, really helped us. The suspect who walked into Lewisham Police Station was 33-year-old Nigel Farmer. His phone was examined uh, and quite quickly we saw that there was a, a number that kept repeating calling him and that was uh, a woman by the name of Faye Collier. And when we did some work on her, she, she was uh, came back as being linked to a small dark car. That dark car, or, or a dark car, had been seen on the night of the murder by a witness uh, we uh, identified through the anniversary appeal, close by to the scene, somebody changing clothes. So we start to think, right, okay, we're starting to piece this together. We'd already then had uh, some of the bank transactions because there was bank cards stolen, and we started to get CCTV from the local community, but also on the buses. And then we got an image of somebody using the bank card itself. So that really helped us. We then put that out into the local policing circles and somebody identified that as Danosonics. 